Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello, everybody. This is Seth with the World of Paleoanthropology. Today, for another episode of The Story of Us, we have a wonderful guest today that I actually had the pleasure of seeing in person for once, and that is Dr. Craig Stanford. How are you today, Seth? I'm great, Seth. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're most welcome. I'm very happy to have you. And I had a, I had a look at your website and saw a couple of the video clips of your other previous speakers, it's, it's really great that you do this. It's really great to have a platform for people to talk about human origins, you know. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely a passion of mine to just kind of get as much of that information out there to people who want to learn about it. Yeah, yeah, great. It's a great thing. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? What do you do specifically? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm a, tr a primatologist which primarily, which means that I have spent my career studying the behavior of non-human primates, usually in order to learn something about us, about ourselves. So of course, the primates that are most closely related to us are the ones that interest me most. So a lot of my career has been spent in forests in Africa, East Africa mainly, studying wild chimpanzees and to a lesser extent, mountain gorillas. And I've done other work with other primates and also I'm actually very involved, although it doesn't show up much if you were to Google me, I'm very involved in the nonprofit world these days and environmental issues, basically because I feel like, well, it's kind of like, I, I think that some of the people you've had on your show who are involved in excavating you know, the fossils of early humans also are very concerned about kind of the cultural context mm -hmm. and preserving these sites for posterity and for future generations of researchers and they often are the natural heritage of the country that they, the fossils come from. So in the same way, primatologists usually at some point in their career uh, turn to protecting and wanting to help protect, you know, the animals that, that basically our careers rest on. And so I'm involved in a lot of those environmental issues these days. But yeah, most people um, know me best for um, the work that I did with Jane Goodall in the 90s when I studied chimpanzee behavior uh, with her at her famous field site in Tanzania, Gombe National Park, and studied um, the hunting behavior, and meat eating behavior of chimpanzees. That's one of my one of my long term studies. Which, by the way, I'm currently reading. You know, it, you know, it'll work. There we go. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I was going to do. <laughs> I was going to do endless promotion at some point for it. Right? There's my. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah that's, um, that's my most really... recent primate book. Yeah. Yeah, I'm currently reading it, absolutely loving it. I'm loving the perspectives that you're okay. giving, and I recommend it to everyone. Oh, it's called The it. New Chimpanzee. Yeah, The New Chimpanzee, Harvard, Harvard Press, Harvard University Press. I've always felt, um, I've written a lot of books, probably too many. I think my colleagues make fun of me for being a little anal about writing books, but I just enjoy the process. And um, I've always tried to write books, even if they're scientific monographs that are readable, you know, that somebody can dive into and read a vignette at the beginning of each chapter that gives you a little bit of a, you know, of a common ground so that you don't have to dive right into the technical jargon. And I think so far, I haven't finished it yet, I'll be honest, but so far I think that is exactly what you're doing in this book. And I highly recommend it to anyone who is interested in, you know, chimpanzees and ape prim primatologists work and their behavior and it's it's been a great book so far great thanks thanks so how did you get involved in all this i mean working with jane goodall that's that's a pretty big thing yeah how, how did that come about yeah that was definitely um a, a high point of my career among other high points but i you know i grew up as a kid i was i grew up in uh, suburban new jersey right outside new york city not from an educated family um, not, you know, higher education, but I always wanted to do something with animals. And so I did. And I actually wanted to be at one time uh, a bird biologist or herpetologist, you know, reptiles. 
And then in college, undergrad, I kind of shifted toward primates because I, I realized, I learned that there was an avenue to be a graduate student and study animal behavior, meaning primate behavior, and basically go off to, you know, I always jokingly, half jokingly say, I wanted to be the love child of Charles Darwin and Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I live in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and to be honest, for any, any younger person listening or watching, I, I feel like I did, I did something that a lot of people these days don't do because they think it won't work, but really can often work. It can often turn out well for you, which is the, to, to, to write to people who are often very famous people, in my case, Jane Goodall, and, and ask them if you can go work with them. And you kind of assume, oh, well, she's not going to even answer my, and this was before email when I did this, right? I was living in, I was living in a rice paddy in India, actually, in Bangladesh when I did this. So I thought it's like a message in a bottle or something. Um, <laughs> but, but in fact, I wrote a, a very short letter to her. And uh, I also wrote to about uh, five other leading lights in my field, but not household names, not names you would know, really, um, but pre prominent scientists. And then when I got back to Berkeley, where I was in grad school months later, the only person who answered my letters was her ironically. Wow. And so she invited me to go work with her. She wa I, I was finishing my PhD. I already was getting a PhD studying a little known species of monkey called the Cap Langer monkey that lived in Bangladesh. And um, I was thinking about my, my post PhD plans. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't want to be a professor at that time. Being a professor just seemed really stuffy to me. I wanted again to just do some adventurous stuff in the middle of nowhere and study wild animals. And um, Jane wrote back and said, I need to meet you. I need, I, you need to get money from somewhere and you need, to get, <laughs> you need to get permission from the government of Tanzania, which has not been easy for foreigners lately. Um, at this time in the 90s, she was saying this. So that all worked out. I met her, I met her um, at the home of another primatologist in DC when I was at a conference few months after this letter and um, you know, we, we chatted, we hit it off and um, she said, yeah, sure. If you can get the money and the research permission, you can come work with me. And I had proposed a project to her. Um, so, so when I was doing my PhD work in Asia, the animals that I was studying were getting eaten by jackal. Jackal, which are kind of like coyotes, right? They're small wild dogs. But in the forest where I was working in South Asia, they were actually predators on a lot of things, including monkeys. So I was really interested in predation and the impact that a predator can have on a prey. And I, was, I thought, well, gee, you know, in the case of chimpanzees, they're, they're predators. They're primates and predators, and they eat other primates as their prey. So how fascinating, right. how fascinating to look at a predator-prey system, both from the perspective of the predator and the prey. So I, that's what I pitched to Jane. And she said, uh, sure, you know, take a look at the impact of one species on the, each species on the other. And that's what I ended up doing for six years in Tanzania during the 90s, then went on to my own other projects, uh, mostly elsewhere in East Africa. And that's what I've been doing mostly ever since. That is an amazing story. And it's, I, I have to agree with you on the point that you made where, you know, you, you don't know what's gonna happen unless you put your foot out there. You know, yeah, and I mean, you know, it's interesting. Um, I get a, a lot of messages from young people, either inquiring about grad school because I, I mentor doctoral students, or even younger people than that, just with questions about chimps or wildlife. You know, high school, middle school students, and I answer them. To be honest with you, just to digress a little, I always answer the questions not because of my work with Jane, but because when I was about twelve. I was one of those kids writing letters, <laughs> but again, no email, because we're talking about like the 70s now. I was writing actual physical letters to zoo curators all over the US. I had a menagerie in my bedroom at home and my parents tolerated it. They, they used to always say to my grandparents who thought it was bizarre that I would have huge pythons in my bedroom. And they would say, <laughs> it's so much better than drugs or alcohol. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they tolerated it. and. Um, I just started writing letters to zoo curators because I had a very limited library. Of course, there was no online resource at that time that you could just Google something, asking them a bunch of questions. Oh, I have this Python I just acquired and tell me about it, you know? And I, I learned from that experience. I had zoo curators writing me back. You know, they're writing to this 12 year old kid who's just a, just a kid in a, in a suburb somewhere. 
that giving that having the patience and giving that time to young people is something that should be part of your life and part of your career. So I've always done that. And um, I then, throughout my life, I've kind of done that. And I'll tell you a very sweet story related to that. You won't know this name, none of your listeners who are interested in human origins, but there was a curator at the Bronx Zoo in New York named John Baylor at one time. He was a, one of the most prominent herpetologists in America. He worked with turtles and, and related species. And I read, he was one of the people I wrote to when I was 12. I didn't know who he was. I just wrote a letter to like literally Reptile Department Bronx Zoo, mailed the letter. And he answered me with a long letter. Like he actually wrote back, answering all my questions. I wrote back again. We had this back and forth correspondence that went on for a couple of years. He was incredibly patient with me. I wish I had the letters still. I, they were lost sometime long ago. But uh, so, so then like 30 years later, I had a grad student who wanted to do, do work with tortoises and I became interested in doing work with reptiles also in addition to my primate work. So I emailed John Baylor and we had another, we had another back and forth, except now I'm, you know, I'm like uh, in my forties or something. And, he, and he's now a senior older guy. And, and I, every, every exchange of emails we had, I wanted to tell him, hey, by the way, you don't remember me, but I was that one of those many 12 year old kids asking you questions about pythons and rattlesnakes way back when. And um, at one point I did not receive a reply to my letter and it turned out he had passed away unexpectedly oh. of, of heart disease at a much too early an age. So I never got to tell him um, that I was one of those geeky kids, but I always felt like that was closing a circle that, that, that half a lifetime later, I'm corresponding again with this man who I had come to see kind of as a mentor figure just through the letters that we sent back and forth. So today, of course, you wouldn't write a physical letter. You'd probably send an email or you'd go through social media and send Facebook messages. And I get a lot of those messages and I, I do try to respond to them. Um, you know, sometimes they're just questions that you can answer on Wikipedia in about, <laughs> in about 10 seconds. So I might, I might direct somebody to Wikipedia, but I often will just, if it's about career advice, I'll, I'll you know, definitely respond because that's, that is how the system should work in terms of the next generation, right? And I, I can't appreciate enough the way you just approach that and the way you think about this because you're so accurate in saying that people in your position who have the education, the know-how are, in my opinion, responsible for passing that on to the next generation. And unfortunately, there are some scientists who like to keep to themselves. And then there's others who open up the world to the next generation. And I, those are the people I bring on to my show. And oh, cool. I'm just well, so happy. That's cool. You know, I feel like there are so many people out there who are today major influential people in the world and in our society who when they were kids, they were kind of nobodies. You know what I mean? They didn't have great career prospects. No one looked at them and said, this person's going to be a president someday. Look, look, at, the, look at the current president of Ukraine, right? Who we're, we're watching right. every, day, every day, these really poignant news stories. He was a comedian and a, and a dancing with the stars guy. And now he's an, yeah. inspiring, an inspiring world leader. So, you know, my, my musical hero, being from New Jersey, and being a kid of like the 70s and 80s is Bruce Springsteen. I don't know if you know Bruce Springsteen's music at all, but he's a great, he's one of the great rock stars of all time. And he says something that I've always loved. He says, look, when I was in high school, I was the ultimate nobody. I sat in the back. I was a bad student. I wasn't even considered a good musician. I had no athletic skills. I had no social skills. I was the kid in the back who the teachers probably just were in their heads wrote off as this kid's going nowhere. And in fact, then he became Bruce Springsteen. And so the point was, that's kind of his message to teachers to say, you just don't know which kids in your class are gonna end up being president, you know, and which kids, which kids actually are gonna not make much of their lives and which kids are gonna be, sorry, incredibly, Hmm. My house just lost power. I don't know. Did you see that on your screen? Uh, it looked like there was a little flicker, but you're uh, still connected. Sure. I have so. a contractor. I have a contractor <laughs> in my garage. If it happens again, I'll obviously log back on again. But um, okay. anyway, point is that you just don't know. And so you want to invest in kids because they are obviously going to, at some point, some of them are going to take over and be leaders, you know. 
Exactly. And I just wrote an article the other night on why science communication is so important and why, you know, we have individuals, you know, everyone turns to best example, Bill Nye, the science guy, you know, yeah. people like him really, I feel, inspire the next generation. And it's great to see people such as yourself sharing what you know. And speaking of that, why don't we talk a little bit about what you know, being primatology and chimpanzees, of course. Now, most of my audiences, obviously, the shows are more based on human origins, things like that. So we don't talk too much about primates. So can you give us maybe a quick rundown of what makes a chimp a chimp, if that's possible. Yeah, yeah, what? yeah totally, yeah. I mean, um, that's, a, that's a really good place to start because I often tell people, audiences, um, students, that there's a big mistake that the public makes that actually is even sometimes made unconsciously by my colleagues who actually study primates, which is to think of a chimp as kind of an under-evolved human kind of think of a chimp as an evolutionarily challenged human being, as if they just haven't gone far enough. And many people will ask me when I do a you know, lecture book signing kind of thing, so if you gave chimps another million years, would they evolve into something much more human-like? The answer is there's absolutely no reason to think that. We each have our own evolutionary path. We've been on separate evolutionary paths for six million years. One way to think of the evolutionary distance between chimps and ourselves is that we share a common ancestor who lived about 6 million years ago, we know that. Same is true for bonobos and ourselves, 6 million years ago common ancestor. But then each of us has our own branch. So in a sense, we're separated by 12 million years of evolution. So that's a long time. That's a lot of time, even though it's natural to look at a chimpanzee and you see that it's quadrupedal. It's kind of a weird modified quadrupedal with knuckle walking and it's covered with body hair, et cetera. It's easy to think, well, it's way, it's way more similar to our ancestors like Lucy than we are. But you know, that can be misleading. That physical appearance thing could be misleading. So I always tell people that you should just remember that they're not evolutionarily challenged humans. They've gone off on their own evolutionary path. I think that is an amazing point that I've had to try to explain myself because I've definitely noticed that trend as well where people think chimps are less evolved humans, but they are as evolved as we are just on their own line. Now, um, oh, I just had a question. When we're talking about chimps again, oh, that, that's it. So I've always wondered, and I haven't been able to find the answer for this. When did chimps and bonobos split? Uh, there is a little bit of debate about it, the exact timeline, um, but most, most of us, most uh, molecular genetic studies suggest under a million years ago. Mm -hmm. so I've, seen, I've seen numbers as recent as 700,000 years ago, and I've seen other studies, uh, older studies usually that are about a million years ago. So. You know, the interesting thing there is that whatever, whatever the evolutionary time distance is, we're more interested in kind of the functional differences between the two right. species, the two lineages, right? And of course, to a casual, uh, to most, most people who are watching or listening to your program, if you presented them with a bonobo and a chimp, they'd be hard pressed to tell them apart, right? I mean, unless they really know their primates, they'd be hard pressed to. Bonobos used to be called pygmy chimpanzees, mm -hmm. a total misnomer. They are a little bit more gracile, a little bit more slender in some dimensions than chimps, but by and large, they're not. It's kind of a, just a, based on some earlier measurements and assumptions that were really not correct. So there are ways to distinguish. I, could, I can just facially tell them apart, but they're really quite similar. So what's interesting is that their behaviors, they have behaviors that are really distinct from one another, like the fact that female bonobos form alliances with one another and use those alliances to, for instance, defend themselves against um, sexual coercion by males, which female chimps don't do at all. Female chimps do not form these bonds among females really much at all. Um, so bonobos and chimps are really closely related. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, most, 
most biologists who work with some group of animals, whether they're frogs or primates, they have many species to work with. So they can kind of triangulate the suite of traits or anatomies of the different species out there alive today and try to understand what the ancestor was like. We only have four great apes. And you know we are driving all four into extinction, but even if it weren't for humans, there are just four species. So if this, you know, if we were dealing with other taxa, a lot of a lot of other taxa, we might be looking at 50 or 150 species, and then we could kind of triangulate what traits seem to make sense that would have coexisted in, in the common ancestor. But we only have point counterpoint really, chimps, bonobos, mm -hmm. and so so I think our 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 attempts to try to triangulate that ancestor a little bit, a little bit limited, and has led to a, a just kind of too much, too much hoopla, too many silly arguments because we just don't have a lot of basis basis for comparison. Okay, that makes perfect sense. One of those mysteries of science that we will have to figure out as we go on. So, I've I'll be honest, I didn't read the article. But the title seems kind of strange to me. I have heard this story going around that, of course, we know chimpanzees participate in some sort of warfare amongst themselves. But I heard that it was with mountain gorillas. Right. You're thinking, I think you're thinking of a recent paper that is from a, a place called Luanga in Gabon where chimps and, and Western lowland gorillas are sympatric, live in the same forest. And I, I will only point out that yes, that's a, really, that's a really excellent paper. And I know the researchers involved there that many years ago, we, my own project that I did with the Ugandan counterpart in Windy Impenetrable National Park in Uganda, which is the only forest in Eastern Africa where there are also chimps and gorillas living together, chimps and mountain gorillas in this case. It's the only forest in the world where there are mountain gorillas and chimps living together. We saw four incidents where chimps and mountain gorillas got together in, in the same tree for feeding purposes and there were conflicts. In fact, I began a study after I worked with Jane and then moved to Uganda. Um, I went initially just as a tourist because I wanted to see mountain gorillas. This was in the mid nineties. And I, I ran, randomly stayed at a safari lodge with uh, the director of national parks from Uganda who was just visiting. And we had a beer and we talked for an evening and he kind of was a great big back slapping kind of guy and super friendly and, and uh, he invited me to do research there. He said, why don't you come and study our chimps and our mountain gorillas? And I said, well, yeah, the interesting thing there, the interesting angle is you have them together in the same forest. So we began a study that went until the late 2000s basically. And we really were interested in the overlap between the two species. So we documented interesting stuff about their dietary overlap, how far the, each species travels in a day and, and other, other parameters. Um, where my Ugandan grad student, who's now a lecturer himself, his name is John Bosco and Kudanunji, was mostly doing gorillas and I was mostly doing the chimp side. Um, but the point is we saw four times where chimps and gorillas ended up in the same tree and the chimps just dominated the gorillas. Chimps, were, chimps are way smaller but they're also way more kind of high energy. You know, the gorillas are kind of Buddhas and the chimps are, chimp society has a whole lot more sex and violence than uh, gorilla society does on a, on a daily or monthly basis. So it's fascinating. And, and um, we only saw one actual, you know, physical conflict between them in which the chimps completely dominated the gorillas, chased the gorillas out of a tree, even though the gorillas are twice the size of the chimps. So that was interesting. And um, we did publish it, but never as a standalone paper. We talked about it in other papers. So that is kind of the predecessor to what the researchers, my colleagues found in Gabon more recently. But yeah, it's really interesting stuff. And the reason, the, the rationale that we used in the 2000s to do this study of chimps and mountain gorillas was that there certainly were times in human evolution when there were multiple early humans, early fossil hominin species sharing the same habitat. You know, we have, you know, if you go to a place like Olduvai, we have evidence of two species living in the same place at the same time there. In some cases, one big robust, in terms of their molar teeth, their teeth in general, um, hominin and another one that was more gracile in terms of the teeth. 
So we have that information. So we, we would love to know what their ecological relationship was like, right? There, we're, not, we're not really familiar in contemporaneous Earth with two forms of humans sharing the same habitat because they're just one homo sapiens species. So we'd love to understand more about what it was like when that happened and how that might have molded eventually the single species lineage that was left on Earth. So we were able to do that with chimps and mountain gorillas. It was really super cool. And you know, there are other places where you can study chimps and gorillas, but unfortunately, lots of parts of West and Central Africa, like where that Gabon National Park is, you know, um, the animals, not in that park, but elsewhere, the animals are hunted by people for food, for meat. So you can't study them. You can't get close to them. They're terrified of people, understandably. So we were able to get right up close to the gorillas and the chimps in East Africa because there weren't, there weren't any people uh, poaching, attempting to eat the chimps and gorillas in, in Uganda. Wow, that's, yeah. Speaking of poaching and things like that, what are some of the things that people can do? And by people, I mean everyday people, because of course, you know, we have those extraordinary individuals who go out and actually get dirty in it, but what can the average person do conservation wise to help alleviate some of these issues that humans are facing with ecological overlap? Yeah, that's a good question, of course. Um, I would cite two things. Yeah, because it's very, it's very common for somebody to say, attend a lecture that I give, like a public lecture, or, or more likely something that Jane does or other, other public figures, and then ask at the end, what can I do? What can I do to help, like you just said? So of course, it's always possible to donate. To, you know, so Jane Goodall herself has JGI, the Jane Goodall Institute. You go to their website, um, and they're based in Virginia, and you can donate. And those funds will go to a number of causes, everything from reforestation in East Africa, meaning a tree planting, one of the kind of subsidiary organizations or projects that Jane has called Takari has involved planting or replanting huge numbers and thousands and thousands of trees in areas where the, they've been deforested around villages. So to improve not just the quality of life of forests, but also the quality of life of people who can use some of the resources of those trees. And that's really a very big deal. So there's always donating and, and there are, you know, the, there are also research organizations like the Leakey Foundation, of course, that's dedicated to research into human origins. And I would guess that everybody you've ever had on your show, practically everybody, has gotten funding from Leakey or the Leakey Foundation at one time or another. I've gotten several grants in the past from Leakey. Um, so we really, you know, they've just been a huge boon for, for our research over many decades. Then the other thing I always point out to people is that you can make consumer choices when you're shopping for a whole variety of things for your life. And when you spend money, uh, when you're, whether you're buying something from an upscale market like Whole Foods or you're just at Home Depot or Costco or something, when you spend a dollar, you're voting. And you know, I said this uh, prominently the evening, you know, the talk that you were at a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we forget that. And just as many people feel like my vote doesn't matter when you're talking about a political election, I'm just one person. A lot of people feel like, oh, what could you know? What could my buying um, cheap patio furniture that was probably taken from an unsustainable source like an Indonesian rainforest versus buying patio furniture that costs a few dollars more because it was sustainably harvested and certified to be sustainably harvested. What difference can buy a little purchase of a couple hundred, few hundred dollars make? But no, in fact, big international corporations are very responsive to consumer demand. That's how they became big corporations, basically. You know, McDonald's, we all love to hate some of these corporations like junk food places like fast food like McDonald's. But in fact, McDonald's has changed their packaging multiple times over the years in response to consumer groups saying, hey, no more styrofoam, you know, or, or no, more, no more laminated cardboard containers that can't be recycled. And they will do that because they, they know that consumer movements can cost them millions of dollars. And obviously they're all about making mil you know, billions of dollars. So. Just remember that when you buy something, whether it's food, you know, think about 
Think about palm oil. You know, many, many rainforest habitats in Southeast Asia, Indonesia in particular, have been just leveled, often orangutan habitat, have been leveled um, in order to replace these high, high biodiversity, ecologically complex and environmentally very important habitats like rainforest with monoculture, single culture plantations of palm, palm trees, oil palms. And those oil palms produce fruits from which you can process, you can obtain and process a cooking oil, palm oil, very unhealthy, very high fat and cholesterol oil that is widely, widely used in the developing world and which we put into our junk food here also, your, your vending machine Twinkies and cupcakes and things often have high levels of palm oil. So most people in the world I find are more savvy about this than Americans are. When I've given lectures, go to, go to the UK, go to New Zealand, Australia, people just generally are aware that avoiding buying uh, palm oil products is a good environmental thing to do, to avoid that. And, you know, just think of the impact that uh, choosing to buy one kind of Halloween candy versus another that you're going to put out for trick-or-treaters. Just think about what a massive amount of money that is for a society when you come to some holiday that basically celebrates junk food, which is what Halloween is in America, right? So, so you, you can have an impact. And even when people don't quite appreciate that, it's, it's real. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I loved when I heard you say it at the event that every dollar is a vote. And I think that's a very, very true point that a lot of people in this country don't really understand. No, we don't think of it that way. And of course, we live in maybe the ultimate capitalist society where the bottom line for corporations is the dollar. And we assume that that's the only bottom line. Well, maybe it is the only bottom line, whatever they say about business, business ethics and societal good. But nevertheless, the if the bottom line includes behaving ethically, environmentally ethically, then great. Then you, know, you have to incentivize these things. You can't really expect a large corporation with all of its shareholders and the enormous investment of money that they make and that they lay out and that they make. You can't expect them to just change their ethics just, just on a whim without any incentive at all, right? So you have to essentially shame them into changing their policies or else it's gonna hurt the bottom line. I actually think that's, that sounds a little cynical, but it's just real. And so um, it's no different than when we're working in Africa or Asia and we want to prevent local people from cutting down the forest where the gorillas live. So how do we do, or, or killing the, gorilla, the gorillas directly? How do we do that? Well, we incentivize leaving the gorillas alive and healthy and the forest too, by trying to funnel a little bit of the money generated by tourism, gorilla ecotourism, to the local people, to build clinics or schools or hire school teachers or doctors. And that's just allows local people to make a very, very rational decision about, you know, do I exploit these animals that live in the forest around my village? Um, do I, by directly, you know, eliminating them or do I, do I help to preserve their populations because that'll actually benefit me more? So we all have this, you know, high, highfalutin uh, ethic about saving these endangered species, but I don't think you can really expect people who are desperately impoverished to follow those notions without there being a really direct economic benefit for them. And that's important for people to understand and just some more issues that we face that we have to overcome. And so going back to chimps, what is one of the biggest misconceptions that you've come across that you typically correct? About, about, them? about who chimps are and what, and what their behavior is, you mean? Yeah. yeah. I think, well, one, one would be what I said earlier about the idea that chimps are uh, somehow under-evolved people who are going to, if you gave them a million years and we didn't drive them to extinction, who would evolve into something more human-like, which is just not, you know, there's no reason to think that. It's a little bit like saying, um, you know, if you gave humans, if you gave us another million years or five million years, we might evolve wings so that we could fly and avoid rush hour traffic. And, you know, it's just totally nonsensical 
speculation. So that's one, that's one big misconception that, as I said, it isn't just people in the public who haven't read as much. It's even colleagues kind of have this implicit uh, kind of internalized bias about exactly what chimps are all about, is, is exactly where they are he headed evolutionarily, even if we, even if we were wise enough to, to protect them. That's a big misconception. Um, I think there's also, I mean, Jane Goodall herself dispelled many of the early, very basic misconceptions. She showed that, you know, um, that chimps could be, that they were not vegan, for instance. Everybody assumed they were vegan. My own research was on hunting and meat eating. That's something that Jane herself discovered in 1961. And um, people at the time thought it was anomalous behavior, thought it was pathological behavior that they were eating meat. Turns out that's a completely normal, systematic part of their lives, part of their diet is to hunt. So that's a misconception from an earlier era that most people now realize was you know, a mistake. Um, not a mistake, just based on ignorance of us not knowing enough about chimps. Also the idea that chimps are basically these peaceful, you know, we used, to, we used to think long ago that gorillas were savages and that they were super dangerous to people, when in fact, we now recognize that we're, we're, we're dangerous to them. They're not really very dangerous to us. They tend to just want to be left alone. And the only way you're going to get injured by a wild gorilla um, is, is, is because you get a little too close and you scare the gorilla and the gorilla responds by either thumping you with its hand or maybe biting you if it really feels threatened by you. Um, so dispelling that myth and, and realizing that we're really the danger facing gorillas is another big kind of misconception. You know, I mean, I, I always, I point out, and I have, I have old slides of this, of ecotourists visiting mountain gorillas in Uganda and the, and the tourist groups are all wearing face masks, surgical masks, mm -hmm. which of course, pre-COVID, it looks completely weird to see all of these Western tourists in their expensive safari bush outfits that everybody buys before they go on safari, right? Uh, where, you, where you're wearing clothes that cost what an average person would, would make in five years or something in Africa, right? Well, that's why I find it weird. But they're all wearing face masks and you just think, wow, and now of course, post COVID, it doesn't look bizarre at all. We understand that the real health risk here is not you being attacked by a gorilla, it's you coughing and spreading one of your just diseases like a cold or a flu that you have or tuberculosis um, and the gorilla being infected by it because it has had no contact, no immunity, no resistance to any of those human um, viruses or bacterial diseases. So that's a big, that's a big misconception that we, we actually now realize that we are the threat to them. They're not the threat to us. Which, and I think a perfect example of that would be another thing that Jane did at Gombe where the chimps came down with polio, unfortunately. And um, now if that happened today, would we intervene, do you think? Or have there been rules that we definitely leave nature to nature? Um, you know, yeah, that's always been a debate. Uh, it, it, it was when polio first broke out at Gombe, which was in the 60s. I believe it was the late 60s. Um, there was a debate about what to do, but at the time it wasn't so easy. It wasn't so easy to intervene. Eventually, I believe it was intervened, and it was almost certainly, although it's never been actually proven, spread into the chimps from the local human populations because polio at that time was still not eliminated from, from you know, from human populations. If it happened today, I think it almost certainly we would intervene as quickly as possible. You know, it's kind of like um, if COVID, no doubt COVID, we know COVID has, it has afflicted captive great apes, mm -hmm. especially gorillas. If COVID you know, were known to be afflicting wild chimp populations or wild gorilla population, we were seeing them not just, you know, with some kind of cold symptoms, but dying, if it were kind of a higher mortality rate, um, more virulent, then I think almost certainly we would make an effort to vaccinate those animals simply because we are managing the, many of these wild populations we essentially manage. You know, we, we use them for ecotourism. Um, we, we know exactly how many there are out there in terms of mountain gorillas, there are about a thousand left. And I think we acknowledge that, you know, 
we don't pretend that they're wild animals, that we're just watching them. We recognize that they're wild animals whose very existence year to year depends on us. So no, I think today, I don't know how you would do it exactly, but I think that you would do that. And I know, I know of cases at Gombe in Jane's, Jane's site, where in theory, we want to not intervene and just see how things play out. You know, let's say that a, do a dominant male who's very influential gets sick and he's kind of, you know, he's, he's dying or he's really ill. And then we wanna watch how the political dynamics play out to some other male take advantage of that and, and, and replace him um, or throw him out of the community. Um, but in fact, you know, I know of cases where, where there was an intervention and where uh, a high ranking male, formerly high ranking male who was really sick was given antibiotics in, in, in bananas. I mean, literally where a researcher went out to the forest and gave bananas and gave water to a, a, a big male chimp who simply was too sick to walk anymore and was just lying in a thicket because he had been wounded in, in a fight with another male and he had really terrible uh, lacerations and wounds that were infested with maggots now. And that male recovered probably because he was, his, his wounds were treated, actually manually treated even by researchers and then given bananas that were laced with antibiotics to get rid of any systemic infections, right? So yeah, I think that, you know, you just have to acknowledge that we're managing these populations, that it, it would be completely two-faced to say, oh yeah, we're gonna go and study them and we're gonna be there every day and we're gonna, they're gonna grow up with people sitting near them. But when something like that happens, we're just gonna let nature play out. That, that doesn't make sense to me. I fully agree with that. I think if we're already there, we're already pretty much involved so we might as well do what we can now one thing that i have found extremely interesting in your book so far and of course i haven't finished it yet but the part where you're discussing how alpha males seem to live longer than non-alphas but you had the counterpoint that um if i remember properly you you used the example of US presidents. And their reason for living longer was better access to medications, their you know, wealth, et cetera. What ma makes it more likely for an old alpha to live past his days? Yeah, so yeah, just to set the context for those listening, that was a conference paper that I did with a grad students and colleagues some years ago in which it was actually based on a study that was done of US presidents and their longevity that was done by, I don't recall the name, but he was actually an MD. And he, he put together data, you know, so, so on the one hand, you might think that those individuals who rise to power in human or chimp society would suffer from stress and other kinds of ailments and fights that they need to engage in to rise to power. Physical fights in the old days now just political battles if you're talking about people. But that actually what was found was that if you, if you looked at society that, um, and you use US presidents as, as a, a measure of being a, a dominant and alpha male, that they tend to live longer. And you know, of course, if you looked at, you know, a, a lot of our early presidents were aristocrats. So whether it's, we're talking about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson and whoever, you know, they, they had their better nourished, they had far better health care, such as it was in those days, and they lived a long time relative to the average person who succumbed to who knows what kinds of, you know, inflammatory diseases or whatever much earlier in life. So yeah, we know that alpha male chimps live a long time also, despite the fact that they do engage in all kinds of battles. I would, I would add that since we did that little conference paper, which generated some debate and discussion, we've had two presidents, Trump and Biden, who are really old. So, so I'm, I'm guessing if we redid that little analysis now, it would be a much stronger result even because now we have this evidence that we had, you know, what I mean, uh, will Biden be 80 when his, when his first term is over? Something like that. I right? think so, yes. Yeah, something like, like that. that. And, and Trump was, was uh, whatever, um, you know, upper 70s, mid 70s when his term ended. So yeah, I think the evidence is that um, whatever else is going on with their health and their ability to be well nourished and all that, Obviously today, that's not as big a deal for, for people. Um, there, there, what is evidence that being an alpha 
is correlated at least, and we couldn't show causation, but it was correlated with living living a long time. And I guess, uh, yeah, so, so the original assumption was, you know, there are a lot of these things, you could Google this and see all these images where you look at a photo of Obama in his first year as president, and then another photo seven or eight years later when he's finishing his presidency, and he looks way more than seven or eight years older. George W. Bush the same, but so you, you tend to say, wow, being president really ages you because of all the stress. It's like the most stressful job in the world. But actually the evidence is whatever you're, you know, however gray you've gotten, that these people tend to live a longer lifespan than everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was kind of the issue about that. But to be honest, the interesting thing, that was just a little study, but the interesting thing is that, um, you know, why does anybody, why does any chimp, if we're thinking about chimps, want to be alpha? It's really stressful. We know that high ranking, Male chimps have high parasite loads, often higher than lower ranking chimps. Um, they have often high cortisol level, high stress hormone levels. So, you know, it's difficult to, be, uh, to become alpha. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of work. You spend this sort of a 24 seven job trying to rise in rank and cultivate alliances with other males and to who will support you. So there must be some good payoff. So we always assume the payoff must be that alphas have more kids, have more offspring. Um, in chimp society, I'm talking about. And that was, uh, that is, that is a little controversial because it seems like some research sites, that's true. Others, it doesn't appear to be as clearly true. But I think that when we have decades and decades of data on this, how many babies have been fathered by different males in different research sites, we're going to see that by and large, alphas and just high ranking males, um, not necessarily the alpha, have a higher reproductive success. And that's, that tells you why they want to be alpha and to remain as alpha, as stressful as it is. Incredible how the things that we've learned about even such simple things as stress in chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to give you the floor for a few minutes to talk about anything you would like to, because we do have to come to an end soon. So if it's your new book, or I don't know how new it is, but if it's your book or anything you'd like to share with my audience, you have the floor. Well, all I would say is to sort of bring it full circle. We talked earlier about environmental issues. And, you know, so, so in 1986, Jane Goodall went to a conference in Chicago called Understanding Chimpanzees. And it was the first attempt to really bring together international researchers and get, get sort of a consensus about, about is issues in chimp research at that time. So we're talking 35 years ago. And at that point, there also were people at the conference talking about chimp conservation and how, how much decline there was in chimp populations in Africa. And for Jane, this was a huge watershed moment in her life because she saw that it was just very narrowly focused for her to be all about the Gombe chimpanzees that she'd been studying for at that time, 25 years, and to realize that these larger issues about not only research findings like warfare and meat eating and all the exciting stuff, but also what's happening to chimp populations. Will they survive into the next century or two? That that was really the important central issue. And she had that epiphany and that's really when she became the Jane Goodall who most of us know today for the last 35 years where she's been on a global campaign to spread the word about everything from animal welfare issues for chimps in captivity to the status of wild chimpanzees and all other animals. So kind of an environmental spokesperson for the last decade. So for me, I just see that as a natural, whether you're Jane Goodall or you're everybody else, because we're all, all, all the rest of us are a dime a dozen scientists, even if you're a prominent person, we're just a dime a dozen, but we all should be dedicated at some time in our careers to the same mission, to, to, to trying to save these animals, or at least in your own lifetime, make sure that their, their, their future is, is secured. So I've been doing that, not necessarily with primates. Um, I'm currently the chair of an IUCN specialist group. IUCN is kind of a subsidiary of the United Nations. It's an organization in Geneva, it's the world's largest conservation monitoring body that, that, that measures the current status of everything from tree species to chimps to giraffes to, in my case, some of, some of the reptiles, turtles and tortoises. And I got involved um, through the primate specialist group, of course, 
and the chair of that group, Russ Mittermeier, being a long-term friend and colleague of mine, and I ended up being the chair of his other committee. So I spent a lot of my energy, kind of my extracurricular volunteer energy these days on that, and, and that we have 400 scientists, conservationists in our, on our committee, a specialist group, and I coordinate and kind of am a liaison uh, between the organization and our specialist group for all the work that we're doing to try to keep these animals from going extinct. Ironically, the two groups of vertebrates on earth, you know, kind of higher animals that are the most threatened with extinction as a group are the primates and turtles and tortoises. That's those, and so those are my two groups. It's kind of a sad thing. In both cases, more than 50% of the species in each group are threatened with extinction. And that's for, for a group of that size, both groups have around 400 species. Um, those are the most threatened species globally and uh, groups globally. So that's a lot of what I do. And in fact, the, the, the book that you were holding up earlier, The New Chimpanzee, which I spent a couple of years of working on writing, that was published in, in late 2018. So like three or three and a half years ago. And I have a book coming out shortly in the next few months um, that is being published, co-published by a nonprofit called the Turtle Conservancy based here in Southern California. It's actually in, in Ojai, up the coast from where I am. And, and this is a book that it's called, it's called the, the Turtle Crisis. And it's about the extinction risk to those animals, just as the book that I wrote that came out uh, 10 years ago or so called Planet Without Apes which I have here, actually. This is a previous book. <laughs> in, in the about that. This was a, a little statement about the, the conservation risk, the extinction risk to the great ape. So I'm involved with the other animals as well. And that was a labor of love to write over the last couple of years. It tells the story of the most critically endangered turtles and tortoises on Earth and kind of the backstory of how it is we let them get to that point and can we save them. In some cases where we have like five individuals, or in one case, just two individuals that are left on earth. And we have to try to figure out if we can save those species. So yeah, when you said here, the floor is yours, I, I would say that my current passion is, is all of these extinction risk issues. And I spend a lot of my time and energy working on those. And, and frankly, I, I train doctoral students. So three of my four PhD students currently are doing work on non-human primates, especially great apes. But um, I'm also very involved with other animals and their conservation risk. And I, I expect I will always be for the rest of my career, the rest of my life, so. And I think that is an absolutely noble cause to be devoted to for the rest of your life. And we need more people like you and like Jane and your students, it sounds like. And I just really appreciate the work that you put in in saving these animals and in teaching. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. I, I enjoyed talking about it and uh, it, was, it was fun talking to you for sure. Definitely. Well, everyone be sure to check out Dr. Sanford's books. They are pretty great. And hopefully we'll have him on the show maybe again when his new book comes out and we can talk about that. But for now, we will talk to you guys later. Thank you for adventuring with us into the human past. If you've enjoyed this video, check out our website at www.worldofpaleoanthropology.org and find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching this episode of The Story of Us. I hope you had an amazing time and learning experience. My guests and I had a great time putting this together for your enjoyment. I hope that you learned something and that there's always more to learn. If you would like to watch our previous episodes, please view them on my YouTube channel or my website, which is listed in the description below. And please subscribe and like to not miss future episodes. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.